love to welcome all of you to Open Learning here at American Jewish University, where we deliver digital content to you wherever you may be in the world. I'm Michelle Starkman, and I welcome everybody here wherever you are. We at HAU have been thrilled to deliver online open learning that captures and delivers the insights of our faculty and friends and convenes our diverse and inclusive community to advance ideas, dialogue, and debate. We invite you to share our content with your friends, family, neighbors. We can be found at aju.edu slash open. We can also be found on demand. Check out our YouTube channel, our social media, where things are available at no cost to you. Today, we welcome Jake Cohen, New York Times bestselling author of Jew-ish and Iconash, which really explores a fantastic way of life led by a notion of hospitality, gathering together, and fulfilling our greatest desires. A former food staffer, food editor, restaurant critic, and editorial director. Wow, Jake, you've really done it all. When he isn't contributing to outlets like Food Network, Food 52, and Food and Wine, he's posting holibrating videos and recipes on Instagram and TikTok. Jake is a social media sensation with over 1 million followers on Instagram, 1.5 million followers on TikTok, a fantastic Substack, and so much more. Rachel Ray, I adore, big fan, has said, and I quote, I want to sit at Jake's table forever. His style is one of the most creative mashups of cuisines with big flavors. I love everything about Jake's food, and I look forward to eating with him for many years to come. If you want to go deep into flavor, then cook everything in here. Here it is. Everything in here has to be cooked. And I don't know about all of you, but I've been cooking my way through the book. And with each recipe, I feel like I'm sitting down, watching a little Instagram and eating with Jake. And then your famous line, which I adore, shoving it in my mouth. Welcome, Jake. We're so glad that you're here. And to our audience, Hi. yeah, our audience, share questions. We have a Q&A. Pop things in there. We'll do our best to ask Jake and we'll chat, we'll schmooze, we'll ask questions and we'll get to know Jake. Hi, Jake. Thank you for joining Hi. us. My pleasure. This is so, so great. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what inspired you to become a cook and then an author or an author and a cook? Yeah. I mean, this is always what I've wanted to do. Um, I had this obsession with food and the ability of uh, food as that connector, food as that medium for really uh, gathering community. So I, I knew early on, I only went, I only applied to one college and I was at the Culinary of America, didn't really have a backup and got in. Um, after that, I worked in, at Danielle and ABC Kitchen. I uh, knew pretty early on I didn't want to run restaurants, so I switched over to test kitchens and media, running them for different food magazines, digital platforms. And then uh, I always knew I wanted to write a book, and that's where we are now on book two of just kind of creating this this new world of being able to share recipes with the world um, with that middleman. So I can nosh. I know what a nosh is, but not everyone knows what a nosh is. Can you tell us what a nosh is? Yeah, to me, a nosh is, is it's light eating and it's not, it's not necessarily a snack. It's something, it's just a little bit of something. So to me, when I think of that, it's really like a broad term, but it's kind of with the intention of feeding guests, like someone's over as a guest in your home and you want to give them a little something to eat, whether they're hungry, whether they're not. And so to me, it's like, it could be something like a snack or when I think of a lot of the matriarchs of my family, my, my husband's family, it's this, these large batch dishes that um, they just keep in the fridge and freezer so that they can heat you up a small bowl of something whenever you're hungry. So it's, it's a really broad term, but really to me, it's about the, the concept of everyday hospitality. I love that. And I love that it's such a convener and a connector because that is so part of Jewish community, right? Trying to convene and connect. And so it's it's the notion of having something like in case someone just stops by, right? And being prepared at any moment at any time to just be like warm and hospitable. And and I love that. I love that that is 
part of your culinary journey, right? That it sounds like it was influenced a little bit by by your heritage and growing up. Can you can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I know that there's a lot of diversity in your background and your husband's background, and that all comes together in your culinary journey. Yeah, I mean, I think so much of this book, uh, a lot of this book are family recipes, both my family and my husband's family. I'm Ashkenazi, my husband's Persian Iraqi. Really what I wanted was to kind of recreate that mentality I feel like of my grandmother's generation when it came to homemaking and and having people over and feeding them that I think has kind of been lost a little bit um and I think we need to kind of slowly get back to I think there's an, uh, an uh, there was a overcorrection and now we have kind of moved too far away from the kitchen and this idea of of entertaining and and hosting and feeding our family and friends so Look, nosh is like a very like Yiddish word, but is this a Jewish cookbook? Yeah, so completely. Yeah. And and if you're not Jewish, can you get it? Yeah, I think that's the thing. That's one of the big misconceptions in today's world. I think for most people, when they look at their their shelves of cookbooks they have, a lot of times, I would say majority of the times, if you're a Jew, you don't just have Jewish cookbooks. You have cookbooks that span cultures that aren't your own um, just because it's so integral into how you want to eat or the flavors that you enjoy. And that is part of the exploration around food. So to me, I think, especially being in a place like New York uh, or a country like America where Jewish food has become so intertwined into the, the fabric of our culinary lexicon that it's yeah uh, anyone can enjoy it and anyone can find that, connection since the diaspora is so wide so many cultures are influencing the jewish food repertoire so i I think it's it's a catch-all i love that because you know the notion sometimes of jew like my family's sephardic i think i shared that with you beforehand Mm -hmm. my husband's family is ashkenazi and there's this concept that jewish food is just like matzo balls and bagels but it's so much more than that and you really touch upon You said the diaspora, the diaspora of Jews and Jews are known to pick up wherever they may be, whatever those local flavors are and throw them into their cooking and make it their, their own with a little twist. What, um, what are some of those directions that you took in this, in the book? Like if you could point us in the direction, like where would we go look in here beyond, beyond all of our favorites? Yeah. I mean, a lot of the, the, like, so for example, one thing I really love is kasha varnishkas. Um, obviously, it's it's buckwheat groats and, and egg noodles. And I wanted to do it where it wasn't just like a deli side, but kind of a blown out weeknight pasta. And I did one for every season um, because it's typically seen as this very like heavy, earthy mushroom or onion dish. And I wanted to lighten it up and do it with asparagus in the spring and, and cherry tomatoes in the summer and cauliflower in the fall, and cabbage in the winter, and and have it look a little bit uh, a little bit more like something that you would really want to cook on a random Tuesday night, while at the same time be rooted in a little bit of nostalgia. I love that. I love that it has a, a season, right? Every season, kind of whatever's fresh that season you could incorporate into your exactly. So walk us through this process. I mean, you published Jewish in 2021. We were at the height of the pandemic. You just published this book. How, you know, how you develop these processes during this time, testing recipes, sharing with friends. Tell us how you did it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's funny because I'm literally in, I mean, I'm working on my third right now and it's just kind of this like, machine of turnover it takes about like two years two (laughs) two years in total to do a book and years it start the first year is pretty much development so it's it's writing the book completely and then really at the end of that first year is when I need to shoot the book so that's when we have about like typically eight days back to back to back um cooking every recipe in the book and photographing it 
um, which is fun. And I hand in the manuscript and then we go through the process of editing and going back and forth with my editor and uh, the publisher to get everything perfect and laying it out so that I like, I'm very hands-on, very lucky that my editor is both my, not my editor. Oh yes. My editor, both my editor and my designer are middle-aged Jewish women um, who were already fans of mine before we started working together. So they get it. Um, and my designer lives a few blocks from me. So I'm able to like go over and really have input, which is important. Um, and then it goes off to the printer and comes out and then you got to promote the hell out of it. Well, I think it is, of course, I think it's fantastic. I'm a huge fan but I love that, that you shared that process with us. Cause I don't think people realize, you know, it's all these beautiful pictures and it looks like so, so easy, you know, like the figure skater who comes out on the ice at the Olympics and just kind of glides seamlessly and then glides right off. But that's years and years of development and training and, working out. and this is like the workout of food prep. And I think you've done like a really fantastic job, um, balancing, like balancing, all kinds of flavor profiles. So tell us a little bit about how you balanced preserving traditional flavors and incorporating modern twists. Like the Kashka example is like fantastic, right? Cause you're using scissors. Yeah. How do you do that? Like you did that throughout the whole book. Cause I felt like it's like really contemporary and fun and, and light. Really. I think it's, uh, it's like this combination of incorporating and blending a lot of tradition a lot of traditional recipes a lot of traditional flavors with just the way that i cook and and just i would say in general i'm a very um, i'm very rooted in, in simplistic contemporary cooking and when you start to really incorporate some techniques ingredients uh and kind of bases that we think of when it comes to these kind of old school Jewish dishes, it's actually quite easy to figure out like, oh, how, how would that look like served today? Um, because a lot of it's just done naturally over time. And whether that's uh, as Jews have moved to immigrated to America, whether that's the, the hacks that they've added in when they're swapping out homemade doughs for puff pastry or, or even kosher varnish is a perfect example. It used to be homemade egg noodles. Now it's, it's farfalle. Like the, these are all kind of really good ways that we can see that like the evolution of Jewish food has been happening ever since matzah. Um, okay. And we've had as, as, as the, second, the second, the second we, we left, it's, it began. Um, so I'm just continuing tradition. I love that, that there's this modern twist on tradition, right? So it's really, it, it really appeals to everybody. And it's like really inclusive in that way. And you've done a beautiful job with that. And you've done a beautiful job, I think, engaging us as the audience, right? Like your videos and your reels are just so like refreshing and easy. How did that, how did those come to be? Like, had you know? I, I just, I just do them. I, I don't honestly, <laughs> it's like everyone wants like a get rich quick scheme. No, really, it's that, yeah. that for me, this is a medium in which I'm able to expand my audience of people seeing like what I do. So I'm sharing easy recipes on social that people are going to make and then they fall in love because I give them the power to make the best snack and cake or the best weeknight pasta they've ever done. And once they do that, there's that loyalty that I've built with them that makes it that much easier for someone to put in the trust of investing in a cookbook and figuring out how that like can really expand. Cause if you love, if you really love a couple of my recipes on social, then guess what? Getting a book with 115 new ones is really going to be up your alley. Well, I, I think the thing that you really, that really resonates is that you've empowered us, right? You've empowered yeah. us not to be afraid to jump in the kitchen and to try, like you make it that's seem it. really approachable. And I think that's, that's a gift that you've given all of us and it's home cooks that we don't, you know, we've all learned alongside our moms and our grandmothers and my dad, you know, my dad was like the expert chopper in the kitchen. And, and I think there's a real gift in that. And so what, what advice would you give all of us? Like what tips and tricks would you give to the home cook? Like you're at home, you know, like if you know your stuff or you don't know your stuff, like where do you start? What do you do? It's very simple. They're, they're really, it's three things. One, patience. 
like you have to understand that like patience is the 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 one ingredient that's missing in most kitchens and that means if you're reading right, a recipe no. <laughs> if you're reading a recipe if i'm telling you like when it's like challah let yeah. it double in size uh, guess what? If after an hour it hasn't doubled in size because your kitchen's cold, you got to wait longer. That's, I, I don't know what to tell you. You've yeah. got to wait. This is not like, it, like this is the reason. And it's like, oh, what happened to my hull? It was dense or it pulls. I was like, oh, well, that's because you didn't let it rise enough. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, well, I, I, I let, what it, uh, let it go for an hour. It's like, well, uh, you didn't, you didn't, it's all of it. So much of cooking is our visual cues and the times are guidelines. Mm -hmm but not, uh, not like law. So when the visual cue is double in size and you cut it short, that's what happens. So patience is the number one thing. Um, and then the, the other is, so it's patience, salt, just most of the time people aren't seasoning. Um, and that's it. I know like, listen, everyone could be cognizant of, of high blood pressure and not go so heavy on it, but there's a big difference between going lighter on salt and not seasoning. And then I would say the third um, is relax. It's not that deep. It's not that difficult. People just add so much stress and they run around their kitchen freaking out about entertaining or this or that. Uh, it's all going to be okay. It's all going to be okay. That's, that's all I could say. I love it. it. It's like you're describing art meets science, right? The science of letting mm -hmm. it rise and the science of like salting to enhance your flavor. But the truth is it's part art. Just like, it's okay. Like, right. If it's not, you have to enjoy it. Way, it, if it doesn't look exactly like it looks in the book or tastes exactly like your friend or your mom made it, it's okay. It's still, it's still good. Though right? I will <laughs> say that's the power of, of, of having a job like this in which I'm able to see people uh, post these pictures of dishes and yeah. seeing like people who have never baked before make a cake that looks amazing and they're like everyone in my family was shocked that I was able to make this Aww. it's like that that is that's the reward I love that well at the beginning of your book and I don't want to give away the book because people should really dive in and read it and I read it like a book as well as cook from it you give a real comprehensive list of tools of the trade and things yeah. you should have in your kitchen that really make your life easier. I've got like almost everything you've listed here. So thank you for letting me check myself. But do you have a favorite? Like if I had to get like one thing, one tool, one gadget, like is there is there one or two things that we should all really just have automatically in our kitchens? Two things, a kitchen scale, a kitchen scale, because at the end of the day, when recipes, like I call for weights for so many recipes, because if I'm telling you, uh, I don't know, a meaty, like a butternut squash or uh, a bunch of carrots or flour. These are all things that you have to go by weight because they can vary like one squash. It can be a pound heavier than the next one. Um, when you're measuring flour, if you're just sticking your cup in, you're going to compact it and you're going to end up with a lot more. So it's like, I'm a big believer. Everyone needs a scale. It's not expensive i can tell you right now it's more expensive to go through the trouble of making a recipe without doing it properly and wasting those ingredients and then getting a a, a dish that doesn't turn out well um then it will be from spending the 15 dollars to order it on amazon the other one that goes with it is uh, an instant read digital thermometer a digital thermometer is the way that you know forever how do you get a juicy chicken how do you know your cake is done? How do you know your challah is done? All of it, I go by internal temperature. And that that really yeah. is the secret. Right. So this is the scientific part, right? There is actual <laughs> science to some of it. Like it might look great. It might look beautiful. But if it's not cooked inside, you can't eat it. So, okay. So those are real, real great tips and tricks. I love those. I took notes. I suggest everyone else grab a pen and take some notes because these are all real helpful. Um. So it's Wednesday. I start thinking about Shabbat about now because tomorrow I'm going to do my grocery shop and Friday I'll do, and I'll do maybe some prep Thursday night and some prep Friday. So what are you cooking for Shabbat, Jake? <laughs> Share it. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's actually, I'm doing a full menu for my new book. Uh, and so I'm testing out, I'm doing a version a little bit like Cholent, but like a more of a Hameen, which is the, the Sephardic version of it, um, with a couple of twists that I really love for how to take 
I love something. And the, the whole idea is like, I'm doing a whole bunch of dishes that can all be done in advance. So really the only thing I'm going to do on Friday is make challah, but everything else will be done. My, the, the, the hameen will be in the oven. All the other sides are going to be in the fridge. The dessert will be done and call it a day. I love it. So are you making your hameen for Friday night or for, cause I was raised, we called it in my family, Dafina, and I was raised eating yes. it Saturday afternoon. But well, that's when you're supposed to eat it. I'm just doing it now because I have people coming over Friday and I love it. Right. So like, why not? Um, but that, yes, right? traditionally, traditionally, <laughs> that would be exactly what it'd be in. I put it in Friday midday. The only thing is I want it to cook low and slow. So if I only start it on Friday, then I'll have to wait on Saturday and everyone will be gone. Um, awesome. so <laughs> we'll have to wait. We'll have to wait for this recipe because it sounds like it's going to be fabulous. Yes. So there's so much tied in to food and identity. Um, and I, you know, I, I mentioned this before I saw it throughout the book. How did you blend all of those things in, in, in your book? How did you pull in the different components of identity in your family? Um, and, and, you know, your extended family and bring those in. Cause I love your stories of cooking with your mother-in-law. Like, I've yeah, seen yeah. yeah. To me, it's like, like, Great recipes is, is the foundation of a book. Um, I think every book just needs to start with that. Recipes that you make and they come out delicious. Past that, the thing that like I always think about is like, how do I add to the conversation about food versus just creating noise? Which a lot of, I'm like, I'm not going to lie, a lot of cookbooks I get sent. It's like, it's just noise. Um, mm -hmm. And they're nice and they're pretty and sometimes they're thoughtful. And sometimes a lot of it's just like a regurgitation of a lot of other stuff and 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 not really rooted in, in what I love, which are our books that tell stories. So I wanted to really have narrative drive um, these cookbooks because that's really the inspiration behind all of these recipes are these, these vignettes for my life. I love that. And as you've developed, look, you're in a really great space now, right? Like everyone loves, everyone I know loves your social, loves the books, but I imagine it's not always been fun and games. It's been kind of, you know, that we all have, tough spots. And as we build our careers and build our lives, what are some of the challenges that you faced in building, you know, your culinary career and how did you approach them or overcome them? Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, for every blessing, for all of the yeses, there are a million no's. My first book proposal was rejected by every publisher. And it's like, you only hear and really get to champion someone um, at the successes but there's so many setbacks throughout the way of things that just don't work out or, or um, kind of hiccups in the process. So really it's like, I always say, no matter what, you got to stick to the mission. Everyone has like, what is their mission? And my mission is, is inspire people to cook and um, do good for the Jews. And as long as, as like, no matter what, like you just go back to the mission very much in a, in a, in a meditation type of 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 uh discipline to keep rooted in that um and there will be plenty more coming forward i mean listen every time i come out with a new book it's that 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 journey of like all right is this going to do well it would like this one this, i'm very blessed this one made the new york times list again uh, there's a, like there might there'll be a day hopefully it'll never happen but maybe there's a day where a book i do i do doesn't or doesn't resonate or or this or that it's like all i could do is my put my all put my heart put my uh blood sweat and tears into a project and hope for the best and obviously work is very much a huge part of it but also there's a there's a level of luck so so that's sort of interesting because some of us approach going into the kitchen <laughs> with a little bit of that same apprehension right yeah like, the fear and the setback. Is it going to be good? Is it going to fail? I'm going to need luck. So like any tips or tricks for how to handle failures or setbacks, not in the career space, but in the kitchen, right? Like, yeah. Like, like can you turn stuff around if it doesn't work out as you planned? Always. I mean, that's kind of the fun thing is I'm testing all of the recipes for these books with people coming over. So there are plenty of moments where I'm serving things to people. I'm like, eh this could be better. This could be this or so, or as I'm making something, it doesn't work out. So I have to scrap it and I go to something else. So like, for example, a big thing I always, this is, this is truly something I do often desserts. I think a lot of people are very daunted in the realm of cakes and all the stuff. So like, as you're making stuff, if it doesn't come out well, 
I always keep chocolate chip cookie dough in the freezer and <laughs> I make a batch, have it scooped, have it in the freezer. So if all goes poorly, I scrap the dessert and I bake off, off a tray of, of fresh baked cookies and everyone goes crazy. And it's like, oh, you're a hero. I love it. So just have like a little backup plan in your back pocket. Have a little backup plan. Yeah. So on our hearts and on our minds throughout the world and in the Jewish world is very much Israel and Completely. what's happening in Israel. And so I want to give a nod to that because I think Israeli cuisine, which is also this great diverse mashup of of diasporic Jews who've brought their foods from around the world back to Israel, has created this like really fantastic culinary scene and gives us all, you know, insight into the world of of Jews and where we've all come from. Is there a little nod to that in in your book? In all of my books. Yeah. I mean, I love, I, I go to Israel. I try, I mean, I try to go every year. I was just in uh, in Israel this past June for Pride. Um, and I mean, hopefully I'll be able to go again next year. Um, I think a huge, a huge thing is like, I'm always looking for inspiration and to be in a culinary capital that's so rooted in our community um, is magical. So like the big inspiration in this book, I mean, obviously there's tons of dishes that touch into um, Israeli cuisine, but the one that I really love is are these um, uh, fudgy date brownies and they were inspired going through the Shuk and I picked up some medjool dates and yeah, I like bit into one. It was just like so fudgy and it just like hit me. It's like, oh, what if I did a brownie that mimicked the fudginess of the date and then put in the date in the brownie so that the date was mimicking the fudginess of the brownie. Um, and it's become one of the most popular desserts in the book. I love it. I haven't cooked, I haven't baked it yet, but I will. I am a big fan of the cake. And so I love that. And so are there, are there specific, just giving another quick second, is there, are there any specific Israeli dishes or ingredients besides the dates, which we all love and adore that you find particularly inspiring or that you've adapted in unique ways? Yeah, I mean, part of it's like the, the conversation on like, what is what is Israeli food? What is Jewish food? Like all of this stuff. And and I love those stories. So like for my favorite is Sabih. My husband's Iraqi. So so Sabih is um, like kind of the classic Iraqi Jewish Sabbath breakfast of fried eggplant and chopped salad and uh, hard boiled eggs. Uh, they would typically have it with lavash and, and amba. Uh, and when they came to Israel, it got stuffed into a pita, they added tahini, they added slug, um, and it became this like Israeli pita classic. And to me, popularizing amba, which is this like Iraqi man pickled mango sauce that has like roots in, in Indian cuisine because the Iraqi Jews managed the spice trade with India. So you see lots of influence of, of Indian food and, and cuisine um, on Iraqi Jewish food and culture. So to be able to have dishes like that. And then the way I did it in my book is I turned it into a sippy egg salad with hard boiled eggs, uh, roasted eggplant tossed in a, in a, um, amba mayo dressing. So things like that, where you're able to kind of really tell that story. Um, right. So if you take a bite into the sandwich, you're taking a bite into like an international journey, right? Like exactly. Like exactly. It's, it's like you turn into a sandwich and in Israel, they put it in a pita. And before that it was in a lavash. And then it's like India meets like this is so this is so phenomenal. It's like a real beautiful cultural storytelling through food. And this is very much, I think, the power of food that we're able to carry on the traditions that come before us. And so how how have you told that story? How have you connected from your past to bring you forward to your present and to the future? I think um I think it's through, again, through anecdotal storytelling. It, this is, it's all a journey. It's a journey that I'm on right now. So a lot of it's in live time. So I think that's one of the fun things when I think about like a lot of the stories of this past year are what's kind of inspiring my next book. Um, and it's kind of crazy. It's kind of something that I like, I wasn't expecting. Um, and yet... I'm so grateful for because I just try to like be open to the universe and, and uh, do a lot of kind of crazy things and meet cool people and do cool things with other 
popular Jews and see what happens. I love that. And and speaking of popular Jews, they're like all there are popular Jews like all over your your social media. And we have a couple a couple of questions in the QA from the audience. And they've noticed one of them has noticed your shirt, I called it Goddess Ina. And so yeah. are there any other um chefs or what other chefs? I'm sure there are other. I'm like, what other chefs do you admire and you um lean on for inspiration? Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I have like a core group. I'm very close with with Mike Solomonov of of Zahav and and uh, Cook and Solo restaurants um, out of Philly. He very graciously moderated my my Philly book tour stop. Um, I was just with the Dean Assessment last weekend, and um, so many like creators in the world. Like we were just talking before about Idan Khala Prince is is a really good friend of mine. Ben Jinji, one of my best friends. Like uh, the the sky's the limit. So they're all they're out there. And what about, you know, people like Martha Stewart and Katie Couric and Isaac Mizrahi and Modi? Like those, like, how do those connections come to be? They just happen. I don't know. It's so funny because I had I, I had lunch with Katie the other day and a couple of days ago, I, Isaac called me just to talk because he was I connected him with Modi, who Modi and I um we became friends years ago just through the I mean, we're gay Jews, so it's like we. Right. I know, I know every gay Jew in America. No, it's and, one, or one degree, to. like one degree of separation, right? Like the exactly. The game used to be like six degrees, but in the Jewish world, it's one degree. So completely. Um. So Modi and I live together this summer. So actually, he's he like stories of. There's so many recipes from my new book that I've been testing on him. In the same way that while we were living together, like there were so many jokes that are part of his routine that he would he was testing on us. Um. And that's kind of the fun thing. So thing with like I mean Katie's Katie's the best um uh Isaac kind of similarly he loves food these are people Jews who love food and um yeah I had Isaac for Shabbat a couple of weeks ago and I'm doing this cool thing where as I'm testing out recipes uh with people for my new book I got a Polaroid camera I'm just taking these like Polaroids of all these like cool people and it, it's just like I don't know. I love surrounding myself with creatives from other industries. I try not to surround myself with too many chefs. I find it a little too echo chambery. Um, I prefer people that are just doing cool things that I love. So that's why it's like I love to be around Modi. I love to be around Alex Edelman and Ben Pasek and all and Judy Gold. All of these fun Jews that are like part of my Shabbat group. Um, and I've just become friends. It sounds like they they are all part of a different form of art, right? exactly and so it sounds like it's like all artistic inspiration to me like if it's the you know the culinary arts like it's really an art form rooted in science in my opinion but they all have an artistic you know be it fashion or comedy or entertainment or writing I mean it's all it all melts together so I love that thank you for sharing that um we have a few questions about like background and ancestors and your grandmother um, one person asks that they made, they, they tell us they made your grandmother's hajibada recipe and they want to know the story of, um, of your, your, how that came to be with your grandmother and how you introduced your husband to those great cookies. So that's actually the opposite. They are from his great, his, sorry, his, his great, great aunt. Um, it's her recipe and she is in her late nineties, born in Iraq, um, who lives in Forest Hills in her and my sister, my sister lived in her building for many years, a couple floors above. So we would go and like sometimes say hi, but she came to a big family Seder one year and I'd been asking for it forever. And she doesn't really share the recipe with the other aunts, but brought it to me, that. scribbled, <laughs> scribbled down on a little, like uh, on a little like piece of paper. Um, and it, the funny thing is, is that my mother-in-law traditionally would be with cardamom. Um, but my mother-in-law hates cardamom. So I started doing it. So that everyone would do it with cinnamon because it's just like, a little bit more user friendly for the people picky eaters, and I love it because it gives it that kind of warmth. I still use the rose water, even though she's not crazy about rose water either. But um, it became this really great thing. And for my husband, these are things that he has grown up eating. But um, 
you don't really get to eat them unless you're around that generation of women. Yeah. And I'm not going to lie, they're, uh, they're cooking and baking less and less as they're getting older. And I, how have you over, because I always found the challenge of measurements and scales because my aunts and my grandmother never measured. Correct. Like they'd have a random teacup that they took over from the old country that sort of traveled and there'd be like a line in it and they and they would use that as their measurement. So how did you translate these, this like ancient recipe into, um, I mean, it sounds like a lot of trial and error. I know I would follow them around with a, with a scale and measuring <laughs> cups and every time they they take something, I'd grab the teacup and I'd pour it in and measure it. I, I just literally, it was like mind numbing, having to stop it every time, be like, wait, and there we go. And I was like filming right, the so whole was, thing in case I missed yeah. anything. I was spot on. The great aunt had her random teacup, right? So um, some of our folks here are writing that some of them have, you know, all sorts of dietary considerations, you know, kosher, gluten-free, dairy, soy, whatever, what, you know, whatever it may be. Um, how can they approach cooking from your book, taking those kinds of things into consideration? So the majority of my my baked goods have uh, parv substitutes. They're either parv or parv substitutes. I do a lot of baking with olive oil. I'm just a huge believer that like olive oil is the best fat for cake. Um, so as a result, there are a lot of stuff that's that's parv. There's a lot of stuff that's um, kosher for Passover and therefore gluten free, which I love. Um, and or some like my date brownies. I have a swap for how you can make them both parv or kosher for Passover or parv kosher for Passover. Um, <laughs> so it's our own and, imposed Jewish cul culinary. Yeah. Um, so I'm a big believer in just like doing it all. I also am like a big believer in like, you don't always need to have meat. Like I think the best thing is next week, if you're kosher, the last thing you should be doing is making a turkey. The best parts of the, are the dairy sides. Like I, when I see people who, go out of their way to make the most ridiculous substitutes for every dish just to make the turkey. To me, I would do every Thanksgiving side and roast a piece of salmon and call it a day. And that way you don't even have to deal with the turkey, which is like the hardest thing to do. You just got to throw some salmon in the oven. That's just my two cents. I love that. I so, think go, so go for the full creamy, delicious mac and cheese and mashed potatoes and all those wonderful cheese and Cause right. Cause there's, you know, part of mashed potatoes, eh, right? Par, exactly. No, I will <laughs> say I do a version. That's the thing. I have a one, a one, uh, it's kind of like, it's an under an hour, how to make a full roast chicken, mashed potatoes and green beans. And it's kind of like my, my chi roast chicken dinner that in a quick, in a hurry. And I do these olive oil mashed potatoes and they're delicious. And there's an option if you're, if you are not kosher and you wanted to add in a little sour cream, great. If you, or you could use non-dairy sour cream, or you can omit it and just have these really good olive oil mashed potatoes. Um, and it's just, th there were, there were options for everyone. That is the best part. Um, but yeah, that's it. You just got to be flexible. Uh, so there's a great question here in the chat. People want to know, are your friends and family nervous to invite you to Shabbat dinner? Um, yeah, I kind of hate that because it's Aww. like, no, not my family, because my family love like they 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 they're totally fine to do it. It's more so like friends. Um I have a couple of chef friends that will invite me over and it's the best. But a lot of people, I don't know, they're just like intimidated. And it's like, no, I, I there's nothing I love more than being someone's guest. Um, and I'm a very good guest. I, you know, right. You want to turn it around sometimes, right? You don't always want to be the the host and the and the cook. So exactly. So you talked a little bit about Thanksgiving. On its yeah. coattails is is Hanukkah. For those who celebrate Christmas, New Year's, all these things. So, so what should we be thinking about as we start prepping? for, you know, Thanksgiving will be over in a hot minute. And we start thinking about Hanukkah. Like, where should we, where should we be looking? The um, kogel fries, the potato kogel fries, beyond, beyond. So good. Um, I have a couple of recipes in the book that are just like the, I have really good latke tartines of like making latkes and turn them into these delicious open face apps. And I think that um, really for me, the, the best part is like, 
some like snacky food. So I have these, this fried pickle platter. I have in the dessert, these like Hanukkah cookies that are inspir inspired by like Christmas cookies. So really we get to um, create a tradition. I think that's the most important thing is some kind of routine or tradition that you, you set with your family and what's the intention of like what they love um, and then running with it. I love that. I love that. So more audience questions. I love these. And I thank the audience for sending them our way. Um, if they had to stock their spice cabinet, what should they stock it with? And what's your favorite spice? Oh, easy. Um, obviously it's like, you gotta do like the classics, garlic powder, onion powder, cumin, uh, smoked paprika, um, sesame seeds, coriander is one of my favorites. I would say I'm also huge on turmeric, za'atar, sumac. Ground sumac is probably the thing I love the most. It's just, it's pure acidity and just adds such depth of flavor to so many dishes, both sweet and savory. Okay, that's a pretty fantastic list. So I think, um, I think you have, right? You have a, a list of like different, of different spice mixes and spice rubs, a meat rub. Um, yeah, I do have a couple of things. And I have a pantry section of kind of some of the things that I love to really stock up on and make that become like the basis of flavor. So I do have like a master meat rub, like, which is like my all purpose seasoning for all roast chickens. And it's really good. So any final thoughts you would love to share with the audience, any words of inspiration for aspiring cooks and food enthusiasts? I mean, have fun with it. Be yourself. It sounds so cheesy, but be, being yourself is like the most important thing in this world and industry. Um, and then, of course, uh, Iconosh makes a wonderful Hanukkah gift. It makes a wonderful host gift for Thanksgiving. It is the gift of the holiday season. So um, I have it here. I'm buying more copies. I don't know if you guys can tell. Like, I've had it in the kitchen. I've spilled on it. I've written I love it. it. That's the best, the it's, best compliment. It's like, it's like, right? I've got my little notes. I've. And I've, it's something I do very consciously, even in the size, where I have the option to do. I like, I keep them on a smaller, compact size, because what I found is people travel with it. People take it with them to the grocery store. People um, carry around, gift it. And to me, I wanted something that really could be that like kitchen companion. Yeah. And it's actually, look, it's, it's, I'm going to, I'm going to sneak peek to the audience. It's really quite beautiful because um, I mentioned this to Jake and it's one of my favorite things about his book is we live in this very visual world and we eat with our, eye, you know, we eat with all our senses, but our eyes are first, right? Like we see something and we want it. And I really want to thank you. And I appreciate the fact that there was a ton of attention given to visual representation because we want to kind yeah. of something to hope for it doesn't have to turn out exactly it doesn't have to look exactly that way when i make it but it gives me hope and aspiration and it's sort of aspirational in terms of what i can make so amazon is a great place to pick up the book your local bookseller um i believe we still have a few copies available here at aju because i think you had an option to purchase them when you registered for the webinar those are going to ship out in this next week. And I encourage the audience, take a look at Jake's social. I mean, there's a lot of tips and tricks in there. They open up your desire to open his books and check them out. You get little sneak peeks into what's coming next. And I want to be sure that everyone has access to everything we have to offer here at AJU. So continue visiting us at aju.edu slash open and aju.edu where we have upcoming programs we have a whole on-demand library podcasts all kinds of things that we're dropping in the coming months and jake we want to thank you for your time and for sharing My pleasure your stories your family stories tips and tricks um and a little piece of yourself with us and with our audience um can't wait to see what's next Thank you for being such a dynamic part of the Jewish community and leading us towards this wonderful journey. We talk about Jewish journeys at AJU, this wonderful journey into culinary engagement. And we hope your the audience will come back and be with us here at American Jewish University. Thank Amazing. you, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Jake. Thank you. Bye. Bye.